to be here on behalf of Muskoka Chautauqua moderating today's author's panel. You can't really see it, but here by the lake in the early 1900s, in fact, I think it was 1916, authors gathered to exchange ideas, making this area of Lake Rosso known as the literary capital of North America. And that also sparked the beginnings of Chautauqua in Muskoka. So it's really special to be able to do this and do this with local authors. It's my honor to introduce today's authors. I'm a writer myself, a voracious reader, and we have a diverse selection of writing on this uh, dais. Um, and it was interesting reading it all while at the same time finding common themes that we could discuss throughout. So let's get into it. Starting to my right, I have Chasing the Muse Canada is the telling of the adventures and enlightenment, I would believe, of its author, Lloyd Walton, who is a writer, painter, and acclaimed award-winning cinematographer. Lloyd's book was recently, excerpts of it, was recently featured in Cinematographer magazine, and his films have been translated into, I think, nine languages. His story is a compelling read and offers an intimate portrait of our Canadian landscape as well as Indigenous traditions. Then I'm going to jump over to On the Back of the Wildebeest. Um, that's an adventurous approach to creative healing, creativity, healing, and wholeness by psychotherapist Audrey Jolly. And it is Jolly? Jolly. Jolly. Yeah. That's right. Okay, great. Now we jump into some nonfiction. And um, The Beleaguered is the second in a series. It's called the Beneath the Alders series. It opens a window into small town life in Brampton, Ontario, where Lynn Golding grew up, was raised and born and raised. Uh, but the novel occurs in the time of the Great War. And in the second book, we're once again welcomed into the world of Jessie Stevens, who's discovering her family has secrets and she has secret yearnings of her own. And then from the Great War, we go even further back into 1812 for Come Looking For Me. It had its origin, origins at the Muskoka Novel Marathon, and we have to give a shout out to those people, where authors write furiously for a weekend. And I believe author Cheryl Cooper uh, completed her first 75 pages that weekend. Uh, it's a gripping novel, and the research, I've got to talk about the research into this, about life on the sea during the War of 1812. It, it goes into incredible detail of what went on during that period. It's really impressive. Cheryl captures our imagination as we follow along as the tale of Emily surviving battles on the high seas. So these are four very different books, and I have my work cut out for me. I have to say that uh, I think by saving on the back of the wildebeest as my last read turned out to be very helpful as I found common universal themes between all the four books. So let's start with exploring Lloyd Walton's story and the idea of what Muse is, remember the title here, is Chasing the Muse Canada. And Lloyd, I'm gonna challenge you on your title, which is something that I don't think I often say to authors, but while yours is a most Canadian book and you talk about your work with the Ontario Ministry of Natural Resources, et cetera, the great people you meet along the way, you say your title, the title says your Muse is Canada. But I'm going to say that the muse is actually you yourself in this book because there's so much synchronicity. One thing leads to another. You, you looked at those rock paintings, those petroglyphs. You said, I'm going to get to the bottom of this. I want to know this story. And it all works out that what compels you uh, propels your story forward. So what would you think? Would you think you are your own muse? <laughs> well, actually, a uh, muse to me is a, is a fire in the gut. Something that, uh, as a kid, uh, I had a lot of muses, and uh, <clears throat> I must have had a very combustible gut because uh, all of these uh, places I wanted to go, jobs I wanted to do, people I wanted to be, um, people I wanted to meet, I got to meet. So, uh, <laughs> one way or another, I got to live all of my dreams, and... Um, <laughs> for example, uh, well, I first, uh, and there were muses, but, it, but for every muse I, I, I chased, uh, I sort of accomplished it, but I, but I always learned something to prepare me for the next muse. For example, I wanted to be a cowboy at first, but I found I was, I was allergic to horses. But I learned the cowboy <laughs> code, which I call the code of the trail. Um, a cowboy, when he looks you in the eye, shakes your hand, that's a firm contract. If a cowboy says he's going to do something, he will do it. But he will do it better than he said he would. 
and then he rides off in the sunset. So I tried to abide by that. But then I had a, okay, I couldn't be a cowboy, but I found another bushman. Uh, There's a guy named Davy Crockett, who uh, he didn't need a horse. But what I liked about him is he could grin a bar. That is, he could, by grinning, he could uh, turn a bear into submission. And I actually got to do that several times. And it went on and on and on. I wanted to be a uh, NHL store, and uh, I got to sniff the big time, but I found out I learned I quit too soon. But what I learned being a goalie was uh, um, acrobatic skills that saved my life when I became a pilot because I always wanted to be a pilot. And at 18, I was flying bush planes, and uh, then I found out I, my math wasn't good enough to go to jet pilot school, so I. Uh, I took all of everything I learned as a pilot to uh, uh, learn uh, uh, preparation, planning, uh, practice, and situational awareness become my next passion, and that is to be an artist. And I went to art school and then went on from there. Great. In chasing your muse, how would you say that it transformed you personally and you know, maybe formed some of your values, et cetera? Well, I, uh, well, yeah, well, for example, I've always tried to live up to the, uh, I call it the code of the trail. Mm -hmm. And, uh, that means a lot. That, that also helped me in my, in my, in my life. If, if I said I'm going to do something, I did it. So I was a lot re reliable person. And it, in everything I've, <laughs> as I said, the, uh, even the acrobatic skills, uh, I learned as a goalie, uh, saved, uh, Saved an expensive cliff from running off a, a, a expensive, I'm sorry, expensive lens from rolling off a cliff. <laughs> Things like that. I saved me uh, in, a, in a white water rapids and uh, keeping a canoe upright, that kind of stuff. So everything I learned prepared me for the next challenge. And that transformation also, you talked about it, it led you into being an artist. And so I wanted to talk a little bit about creativity spurring transformation. And I also want to talk a little bit about how we follow impulses and, and when we get to the, the nonfiction books about how impulses are actually suppressed. But, but maybe we can start, Audrey, just with you explaining the metaphor about the bird on the back of the wildebeest and what that means. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the wildebeest is like a buffalo bison in Canada bison, I guess, with the tiny bird that sits on the back of it and feeds off the parasites and the bugs. And the beast is quite happy that it's getting some of its discomfort re removed and as I was writing the piece I this book I just kept coming back to that image that really the bird is is the creative spirit the light that flies it's free and underneath it we have this body of emotion history sometimes trauma that we carry and um so the book is written from the perspective of artist, teacher, and psychotherapist. So, and often those voices talk to each other and, and have conversations they don't even always agree. So I started to notice all these aspects or parts of the self. And I mean, I love the code of the trail. I just keep, I can't get past the code of the trail. Um, whether it's conscious or not. And for me, it's never really, oops, never really been that deliberate, but I, I think I've always been driven to the next um, unfolding, which with the book, the unfolding is uh, we're drawn to, to exploring the aspects of the self that once we integrate them, we move towards wholeness. So I ended up with this sense of, you know, the, 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 um, uh, the bird and the beast are dramatically different but they're also very symbiotic. They assist each other. So we've got this beautiful body and psyche that will hold all of our past trauma. If we have trauma or difficulties, which I think we all have, our bodies will hold that for us so that the spirit and creativity can continue to fly. And the more we resolve the issues from the past, and usually creatively, that's where we go to, we, you know, my next painting, I'm always working through something on a psyche level um, in all the art choices that I make, which are infinite. So um, the book has got exercises at the end of each chapter that will, interdisciplinary exercises that help people to 
drop in and find those parts of the self that long to be known that aren't known yet. And that's a great transition for my next question because the secrets and trauma are, you know, they weigh the wildebeest down. Yeah. And the creativity and you're acting on that creative impulse can actually lighten that and, and bring you to wholeness. And, yeah. and that's where I want to get to the beleaguered because secrets weigh heavily on Jesse and the beleaguered. And um, she has this moment where she can share information. It's, it's really tough when you haven't read the book. So please read these books um, where she's eager to share information she has. And she's met with a resounding slap by her mother. Mm -hmm. and, and I've got to ask it. Here's a very seemingly healthy family. Um, why was it necessary to keep information about that family secret, uh, that history secret from Jesse? Why was that important for Jesse and for us, the readers, to keep that under wraps? Right. So um, I have to back you up just a little bit in answering that question, Nora. So um, the first book in the series starts in uh, 1907. It is at the sod turning ceremony for the Carnegie Library in Brampton. This is a big event uh, because the Carnegie Foundation was paying to have libraries built in small communities all across North America. Uh, the whole town turns up for this ceremony. There are dignitaries from Toronto. There are people from the States, from the Carnegie Foundation. They have the ceremony. And when they're done this civic ceremony, the crowd is invited to rise and go to the local Presbyterian church where they will have a religious consecration ceremony. Everyone rises, everyone goes, except for Jessie and her immediate family. They're not allowed in this church and no one will tell Jessie why. She's only four years old at the time. She starts making inquiries, but absolutely no one in her family will talk about it. She knows that there is a reason. She eventually realizes that it has to do with her grandfather, her mother's father. It has something to do with him being self-made and others destroyed. It takes Jesse three decades and the readers three books to find out why they can't go in that church. But her mother definitely does not want to talk about it. And her mother shuts Jessie down whenever she starts to get a little close. So that is one of the clues to uh, this mystery. She hears um, the family is having a, a disagreement about whether Jessie's sister should be able to date a Catholic boy. Because back in the day, um, in small town Ontario, there were real divisions between Protestants and Catholics. And um, Jessie wades into this conversation, she's older at this point, she wades into this conversation thinking that she can enlighten her older family members about the good things in their town that have happened as a result of people who are Catholic. And um, she rises after saying this and walks towards her mother who's really a very open-minded person and she thinks that her mother's going to embrace her but instead her mother slaps her across the face and says don't ever say another thing nice about that man ever again. So I would be ruining the um, punchline of this, um, of this story, giving out the secret too soon if I told you why, but that is one of a number of little clues that Jessie gets before she eventually learns the story. Can we assume that uh, when those secrets are revealed, it's going to be transformative for Jessie? Um, yes, transformative for Jessie. There are, there are a number of secrets in the book. That one actually slightly less um, uh, impactful than another. But in learning that secret, we learn a lot more about her family and about the town that she lives in. Well, thank you. And, and you painted the portrait of Brampton in the early day, in those not early, super early days, but during that great war time, that was incredibly well done. Thank you for that. Cheryl, uh, your protagonist, Emily, is keeping secrets too. Now, in her case, it's also for sheer survival. So I can give that a little bit away. You've got to read about Emily's survival on the high seas. Um, but coming back to the idea of impulse in Audrey's book, Emily climbs the rigging as fast as any boy. Um, she breaks social mores of her time. But what I couldn't figure out, and I wouldn't even let myself Google it, because I have not read Sense and Sensibility by Jane Austen. I, I, it's terrible. So, And there's this intertextual reference throughout your novel about sometimes it's being read to Emily, other times she's reading it, she loses it, she gets it back. There's even mention of Pride and Prejudice, but she still prefers Sense and Sensibility. So you've got to tell me about the connection between Sense and Sensibility and Emily's story. Okay, well, first of all, how many of you have read Sense and Sensibility? <laughs> 
Jane Austen Sense and Sensibility. How many it, times? It, oh, well, probably five <laughs> or six for me. I don't know. But um, if you don't want to read the book, Nora, watch the movie yeah. with Emma Thompson and Kate Winslet and Alan Rickman. It was it was it was beautiful. So just again to backtrack a little bit. I have, you know, if you, if you had asked me about my muse, I would have said the sea. I'm at my happiest when I am near water or if I'm on the sea. And so several years back, I wanted to write these novels set on the Atlantic Ocean. I was exceedingly um, uh, inspired by a movie called Master and Commander. Russell Crowe, Paul Bettany. I watched that movie like probably 50, 60 times. And I thought, I want to write novels set on the Atlantic. I was fascinated in the world, like little little worlds unto themselves with the captain, his hierarchy, and these often or orphan boys and the crew as well. At the same time, I love Jane Austen. I love the, the period in which she writes her books. And the fact that she had two seafaring brothers Oh, that's great. So one of my main characters is Frances Austin, who lived the longest of all the Austin children and had the most illustrious naval career. Um, his nickname was Fly. He's called Fly in the book. But I also wanted that connection with Canada, thus the War of 1812. So I wanted to just sort of give you a little bit of a preamble. But so em Emily is pulled from the water after a raging battle between the British and the Americans. And the men on the Isabel, the name of this British ship, of course, women, they have Mrs. Kettle, who's the laundress, but men don't often, when they're out at sea, they don't often see women. She's a very attractive woman. She's a very intriguing woman. And they're all very curious about her. From the clothing she was, wore, was wearing when they plucked her from the sea, they, could, they figured that she most likely was a gentlewoman. From her, the way she spoke, obviously she was intelligent. And because she was shot before coming on to the Isabel, she finds herself in the hospital of Dr. Leander Braden. And she's put in a little corner of that hospital. And of course, she's, she doesn't really want to divulge much about herself. She's plagued with, with nightmares. So the men, the cap, Captain Moreland, Fly Austin, the doctor, Leander Braden, they don't know if she's just emotionally overwrought or if she doesn't really want to say who she is. So the men do a very smart thing by allowing 12-year-old midshipman Gus Walby um, allowance into her little canvas corner to read Sense and Sensibility, which Fly Austin just happens to have on the ship. And the doctor says, it is through Jane's book that I hope to draw Emily out. And sure enough, bit by bit, as Emily learns to trust this young, endearing midshipman who is an orphan, um, she starts to just sort of drop a little hint here and there. And of course, the doctor's always out in the hospital, kind of just, just taking it in. And as it goes along, there's another young boy, the little sailmaker, Magpie, who, again, he is an orphan. He used to be a little climbing boy in London. And he's just so excited to have access to talk to this, this woman everyone's talking about. And he's very happy to listen to Gus Walby read Sense and Sensibility. In time, without telling too much, um, a very close relationship develops between Emily and Leander Braden. And um, he finds himself, because he's been listening to the story as well, and he finds himself comparing himself to those of, the, those of you who do know Sense and Sensibility to Colonel Brandon, who was older, had a very, very sad past, very sad love story in his past. And then it, of course, divulges more about Leander, why he is on this ship. And so ultimately, Sense and Sensibility becomes a book that she reads when she's those long hours of recovering those long hours when she finds herself a prisoner on uh, Captain Trevelyan's ship, but also it becomes symbolic of her connection that she's made with these men, young and old, on this British ship. Men who, most of them have been months, sometimes years away from their homes, 
and again, a lot of the children who who do not have, um, they have no families at all. Thus, that's why they're at sea. So it becomes symbolic of her connection that she's made with these men. Thank you for that. You know, you, you mentioned about being drawn to the water. And I'm going to jump ahead a little bit into where I was going to go with this. But um, we've all been drawn to Muskoka. Mm. We're either, you know, in, um, born and raised or have come to Muskoka. Uh, Lloyd's book mentions Muskoka directly. Um, yours don't. But I wondered if the Muskoka experience either informed your writing or whether it allowed you, did it creep into your writing in some way? I mean, we didn't have the War of 1812 fought on Lake Muskoka. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> but yeah. um, it's it's really interesting to to think about the War of 1812 and the history books. We t we know about the land wars. We don't know about the sea wars. Right. Yeah. And yeah. So, it, but bringing it back to that was that you know you wrote it in the Muskoka, started in the Muskoka novel marathon, and and did you, is that why you wanted to write about water? Is it, was it Muskoka that might have had an influence on that in some way? And I'd like to hear from the others too about writing in this, with that nearby, always near water. Um, uh, absolutely. It, just a quick word on the War of 1812. When we went to school, if you learned it at all, it was it was usually the victories of uh, Sir Isaac Brock and Tecumseh, and that was fine. But did you know there were literally hundreds of engagements that took place on the Atlantic, on the seas? I did not know it. Great Lakes, St. Lawrence River, what have you, hundreds. So that was why we're on the sea, what have you. But always right. I, I have a little cottage, a little shack, I call it, on Browning Island. And the, and the cottage sits right on the water. So the water is always there. And uh, the big skies, being able to see the stars at night, maybe in some way when the lights are all turned down, sort of imagining what those men 200 years ago, how they were able to navigate. So and just the, the peace and beauty and also the camaraderie in this community of so many other writers um, has been has been wonderful. So right. I cannot imagine writing these books on the 25th floor of a condominium or apartment down in Toronto. Wouldn't work, <laughs> even if I was overlooking Lake Ontario. No. In the beleaguered, it's a big deal to go to a picnic by the lake. That's right. So I wondered whether that was a little touch of your Muskoka getting in there as well, but uh, I can't put words in your mouth, so go no, for it, Lynn. That, that's right. Um, I guess two aspects from Muskoka. First of all, this book series took me a long time to write. Um, from conception to when it was complete, it was probably about 13 years. And that is because I am a full-time senior partner of a law firm in Toronto. I have three kids, um, which I raised almost single-handedly because my husband was um, not around most of the time. So uh, I had a lot to do. The only time I could write was on my holidays and um, at least two to four weeks of my holidays every year were in school. So uh, I would get up before the kids got up and I would try and get a couple of hours in uh, before everyone else got up and then we'd be doing our thing for the day, water skiing, swimming, all that sort of thing. And then towards the end of the day, I'd say to them, not really a great thing for mother, but don't you think there's a movie you'd like to watch on TV? Maybe some video games to play? And um, they would do that, and that would give me a couple more hours to write. So, um, and I should tell you that that book, it's um, about 113,000 words, but the book series as a whole was over 300,000 words. So it was a lot of writing that I did up here. But I will say this one thing. My book is set in Brampton, Ontario, um, but I'm really touched by the number of people who read it all across Canada and who say, even though you wrote about Brampton, I may have no connection to Brampton, this is the same story as my family had in small town in Newfoundland or <laughs> Alberta. You know, I mean, obviously the country was at different stages of development, mm -hmm. but life in small town Canada, I think, um, was captured um, equally in different communities. So, yeah. all right. And I, I'd like to know if there is any exercises that, that you think in your book, you have a variety of exercises as you go through the books in different ways that can heal you and, mm -hmm. and to get in touch with your creative spirit and everything. And I wondered if there was one in particular that you like to do in the back 40 of uh, somewhere in Muskoka. <laughs> um, well, I, I what I'm thinking as I'm hearing is that water uh, in dream work, psychology um, is really flow and emotion. 
and often sensuality. So I love the water. Um, I love Muskoka and my friends that are up here that allow me to come up and, you know, spend time and enjoy this. Um, so um, I would begin probably working with the element of water because there's earth, air, fire, and water, four powerful ones. And I, I usually begin just by feeling into the water quality in the body. So we're, you know, what, 80%, 90% fluid in our bodies. So I would bring that, the, the awareness right into the fluidity in the body. We've got lots of different fluids that are running through our bodies all the time. So I would, I would uh, tap into that and start finding that the wave quality, even the seaweed that's underwater, feeling that into the body. Because my experience at this point is that there's really sort of no separation on one level with us to the water, to the fire, to the earth, to the... Okay? So I would embody that quality of flow and um, take that into the physical body, maybe take that into watercolors and painting. Gail knows this well. She's done many workshops with me. Um, and I'm very honored to say Gail has said that doing some of those workshops it, that were drawing and painting or moving and drawing and painting, became some of the foundation for her of how she paints today. So oh, so I'm very honored by that. Um, so I, I embody everything first in the physical body and also know that emotions are very much about flow. So every emotion we have, every impulse that, and, and it takes some time getting in touch with all the emotional impulse that's going on in our body, which is dozens every minute. Uh, but to start catching them and realizing each of them is a story, each of them is a painting, each of them has a movement, each of them can go into building a character for theater that you can dress with certain props. I mean, it's just all creative impulse. And, you know, talking about connection, it's all interconnected. We're all interconnected here and we're all interconnected to nature and to others. So that's kind of where I was going when I was hearing some of the conversations, just the sparking, right? So there's a there's a, a spark, which is a little more in the nervous system, a little more on the fire system of the body. And then there's flow, which is more on the water and the sensuality and the sexuality and the, you know, more of a flow. And then there's ground, you know, so so we are, we are all of that in our bodies. We, we sort of see ourselves as separate from the trees, the 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 elements but we're not actually mm -hmm. so i'm always working to get out of the intellect because the intellect tends to take over and try to drive the whole show drive the whole life but actually it's the emotions so the neocortex is a thinking brain there's the limbic which is the emotional brain and then in the lower back first to develop in utero is the reptilian brain, the instinctual brain, holds the creativity, that is driving the whole show. Mm -hmm. Even though we think we're, you know, leading through the head, it's actually not necessarily true. It comes back to the fire in the gut that Lloyd was talking about yeah. as well and, and where that comes from. And, and, and Lloyd, I, I, I'm going to make an assumption that, that I mean, you, you've written your entire book it was after all of your travels and you've traveled and Lloyd's been from LA to the far north and from where I get to perch I see Lloyd go out every night in his electric boat with his camera on Lake Muskoka so how important was it to was how how much did how much of a role did Muskoka play in your book while you're talking about all of these other places <laughs> okay water water has always been a muse to me I grew up in Sault Ste. Marie on Lake Superior as a kid, I'd be a row, rowing, a boat, rowing a boat, and I wanted to be a ship captain someday. I got to be that. When I, uh, when I was a teenager, I worked uh, 80 miles north of the Sioux on the North Shore of Superior in the evening. I'd go down and skipping stones, and the waves would be coming in, and I, I wanted to be a surfer. I wanted to, the surf music craze was on, and um, I wanted to be a surfer. I ended up <laughs> surfing and... and um, in Malibu, and uh, and then I uh, 
On Lake Superior, I also I came across a mystery, uh, Indian pictographs, and I, it ignited a fire in my gut to, uh, to find someone who could tell me and, and reveal some of the meanings of them. I was told at the time, all those people are dead. But that, that fire smoldered in me for 16 years. But um, I also got to uh, do films on the history of Georgian Bay. So I've been all over Georgian Bay. I've, uh, I've sailed from Penetanguin to Chicago. I've, I've, I've sailed with the, <laughs> with the Navy on a, on a mission. Uh, uh, and, um, and, uh, and of course, moving to Muskoka, I had to be back, back, back to water. Actually, where I lived in Toronto, I lived on the edge of the Scarborough Bluffs. Um, I thought I always wanted to move in, uh, always wanted to live in Malibu. In Malibu, I could look out in the Blue Pacific, but in Toronto, I wake up and look up in Great Blue Ontario, uh, Lake Ontario, that is. And uh, <clears throat> so water is a very part of me, but as uh, I think it was Arthur Miller, the playwright said, um, the true story of any play is how the birds come home to roost. Mm -hmm. And all of these stories in my book weave in circles and then they connect to bigger circles and bigger circles and they all come together at the very end on the very last page on an event on Lake, Lake Muskoka. <laughs> boom. Boom. Ba -boom. <laughs> ba -boom. All right. There's so much more I want to get into. There's the the touch on the suffragette movement and the the, the strength of your care, both of your characters during periods when when women couldn't be that strong. You run into very strong women in your travels. Um, your work has made you stronger. Um, but I want to and I want to read something from Audrey's book, and then I'm going to put you all on the spot because I'm going to ask you afterward to just say one word about how you feel when you are writing, when you're in the creative process. So I just this uh, this quote uh, captured me. But to stay vital and alive, one must venture into the unknown, into the forest without the compass, map and flashlight meeting the unfamiliar where creation occurs. And I think one of the most bravest things you can do, and I can say this as a, a person who writes, is a ghost writer, but has not written her own book, is to write a book. So with one word, can you say, how does it feel when you are right, when you have been either writing your past books or you're writing your current work? Can I throw right over to you, Cheryl? Turned on. Is that okay? <laughs> Gary, is that all right? <laughs> Escape. Free. Uh, intense. <laughs> Scared, silly, but thrilled at the same time. That's more than one word. I broke my own rule. <laughs> I can't thank you for those that came out today and to Muskoka Chautauqua. And just think about this. 1916, authors sat around and talked about how it made them feel when they were writing and what how important that process was and how the surroundings around them here in Muskoka propelled that creative muse forward. Thank you very much everyone for being here today and thank you Muskoka Chautauqua. Have yourself a great day, rest of your day in Muskoka. Thank Thanks. you.